English guests, ladies and gentlemen. Now is the part where we have a question and answer session. I would like to invite the floor for questions. If you have any questions, please introduce yourself and, and to whom you want to address your question to. I would like to remind everyone that we don't have the luxury of time, so please keep your questions short and to the point. And I have to apologize beforehand, we may have to keep it short. With all means, I open um, okay. questions to the floor. Any questions from the floor? Yes, sir. Assalamualaikum. Uh, it is very lovely tonight to see all the professionals and all the orang -orang veteran. So I'm uh, Kamaru Zaman daripada NZ Global uh, Transportation, NZ Global Logistic. So I would like I would like to bukan tanya soalan. I'm here just to give my opinion to share apa yang YB Rafizi bagi tahu lah. We firstly we support the government and hope to have many glasses for drinking for everybody. So I begin with not with politics, but to broaden the government revenue. Whereby is what been said by the Prime Minister, the Honourable Prime Minister, the Bagitao, that we are working to make the economy grow. So as a local businessman, we have the passion to work with the government. So give us the opportunity to NZ Global Logistics so that we can run the seaports the land logistic and the cross-border transportation, which is working during bad times and good times. So this is a business that the country should focus because it is a 24-7, 7-11, transportation of 7-11. We are not talking about the 7-11, we are talking about the transportation industry. Every country is talking about shipping. It's talking about transportation. It's talking about cross-border transportation. Tapi our country, we always look for foreigners to come in. We forgot that the local businessmen boleh buat. We have the pay, we have the passion. So please open the window for the local businessmen to come in into this industry. Selalu kita cerita kita nak syarikat international masuk. Ni syarikat Malaya ni pun boleh buat. So we have the passion. So minta YB. Dalam ekonomis ni, tak ada benda yang susah. Selalu kita cerita benda ni susah. Mana benda tu tak ada susah pun. Orang tua-tua dah beritahu dah, tak ada benda yang susah. Cuma kita minta, berilah opportunity for us to work. So if the local transportation company macam kami ni dapat bekerja, we can always call the foreign people to come in. Tapi nampak sekarang ni, kami ni di belakang kan. Tak diberi window. So, minta lagi sekali. Okay, Encik Kamar Zaman. Terima bagi kasih. Bagi peluang. Thank uh, you. Kamar Zaman. Kamar Zaman. Kita, uh, tujuan sudah sampai. Yeah. Jadi, kita minta yang berhormat untuk yeah. uh, membuat uh, jawapan. Dengan, ini cerita dengan kasih sayang ni. <laughs> di uh, di tak ada soalan tadi. So, uh, jadi, <laughs> saya terima, saya dengar. Um, of course, the ideal situation is that um, everyone can grow and compete um, and ideally we don't even need government to lend a hand here and there um, so they are part of it i suppose in the past you know the bureaucracy the intervention here and there so my view is if we entang, you know, sorry, I mean, dismantle as many of these as possible, I don't think we will be needing in the future people coming and say that give us the opportunity because hopefully the opportunity is all abandoned. The government, I think, in the future should not be in a position to give here and there, intervene here and there. Is basically to allow. Um, the ecosystem and, and for people to really compete and make it as easy as possible
to grow and to participate. Right? So as an objective, it sounds ideal. Tapi saya faham, there are so many, um, as I say, tapes here and there along the way. And that's what hopefully we will dismantle. Um, but as I say, there are decisions after decisions that have to be made very quickly in the first four or five months. And once the key ones that cover the fiscal position and so on, then we can start. And I think the message through the whole economy and through the whole government um, machinery, I think the message will be picked up. And then hopefully we'll see you uh, transporting all over South Asia. Thank you. Thank you, Yang Bermat. One more question. We have one more question over here. I think, unfortunately, this is going to be the last question. Uh, tak apa, kalau ada satu lagi boleh tambah. Tak okay. cukup dengan dua je. Uh, I have to, to intervene. Please, go on. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Denison J. Surya. Um, I think as uh, already mentioned by the speakers, uh, dialogue of this nature is very important, especially for non-parliamentarians to muscle, get an opportunity uh, to raise questions, to have similar experiences, and I think I would like to congratulate both speakers of the House for this opportunity. Thank you. Secondly, which is my question uh, to the Minister and maybe even uh, our turn to draw from his years of experience as DPM and as MP, to what extent would the government empower grassroots communities to have a greater say in local development matters uh, because we find a lot of top-down economic planning, very little of grassroots communities, whether fishing community, paddy farmers, uh, small town development, island development. How would we empower them to provide input to EPU, the planning process, uh, and to strengthen grassroots democracies. Thank you very much. Silakan. Thank you, Doctor. In fact, you know, that's, that's on the point, basically. Um, we are working, um, you know, in the next few weeks to launch um, a, an, a grassroots-based um, poverty elevation program. In the past, what happened was that government will pick from a lease and just disperse 10, 20,000, and then that's it. Um, we're going to shift the approach completely. We will be working with as many social enterprises as possible. Um, we want to make sure that there's a sustainability and we want to bring in the local community to work with it. So there will be a shift, um, and, but of course, implementation-wise, it will be in stages. We have to do a few pilot all over the place first, see how it works, and then if this pilot um, case works well, um, by half a year, we hope to scale up all over uh, the country. So, um, at my ministry, is, you know, we, we've been talking about that. Um, the stakeholders are very different nowadays, and precisely because, as I said, we need to be more agile, the channel is very different than in the past, where one instruction, it goes and it filtered down, actually is almost flat now that we have to work with as many CSOs and community groups. Um, in the past, for example, if we want to push certain policies, say dengan Belia, you work with Persatuan Belia. Uh, and Persatuan Belia has layers daripada daerah all the way up. The hierarchical nature of that is not as effective as, for example, different groups, locally based, community driven, um, where they take stake in, in, in their surrounding, and you work um, in lateral with as many such groups as possible. It is more difficult to administer the risk is slightly higher because it's, it's not as um, 
control as before, it's no longer as in control environment, and you have to manage the stakeholders' process um, a lot more rigorously. But there's no two ways about it, because government cannot um, control and manage everything anymore. Um, there's a limit to how much we can know and we can plan. Um, we hopefully will be able to set the parameters, allocate the resources and channel those resources to empower such social enterprise and local communities to work together and we are ho hopefully we will test it with um, um, poverty elevation program first because we want to plug them into the food value chain by community but of course, you can't just give it to them. The government then have to bring different different stakeholders and players along the value chain and, and, and plug them and uh, assist um, the local community to work. Um, and hopefully, if that works, then that certainly will take more chunk of um, our efforts going forward. So, you know, the plan is um, February. So it's um, in about a few days, um, hopefully um, we'll, get, we'll give more info. But of course, again, um, this is also, which I hope um, and I realize, is a lot easier working with your social enterprise with just about 100 people than working with one social prize and scaling it up to millions of people. Uh, the risk of um, it is not going as your plan, the implementation risk is a lot higher. So that's why you know, we will take some months to pilot it, but if it's okay, most probably we want to make sure that it's going to be the mainstay of um, basically policy approach in the future. We thank the Minister for the answer. Uh, Lady, I will, I will take on as an intervener so that oh. we go a bit faster, okay? Yeah, sure. And that answer was good, I think, in terms of theory. But coming back to what the tone said, maybe it has just gone halfway. Can we have the next question? Yeah. Good evening. Tun, would you like to comment? I'm sorry. I would like to comment. I would like to comment on the last question. Um, simple, simply, simply put, uh, there are two ways, two methods of uh, the riot reaching uh, the government. Number one, as long as our system is called uh, parliamentary democracy, we could use these representatives uh, as go between, if you like, in issues relating to the interests of the riot. Uh, I noticed that many representatives or, um, are, who, are, who are members of parliament or state, some of them really establish their own centers as well as giving opportunity for the riot to approach them directly. The second way is to try to empower um, uh, organizations or clubs at the lower level. And I get the impression that nowadays they are less active, but more so in ceremonies rather than serious issues being brought up. Those are the two things I, I would like to offer to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dun. Less ceremony and more uh, abrupt reaction. Uh, can we have the last uh, question again? Your name? My name is uh, Mugunta. Dun, can we have one from the women, please? The ladies the back. Oh, the lady, you mean? Yes. Uh, maybe... Oh, um, yes, okay. You got the, the floor because first? you raised your hand first. All right. Kita ringkas ya, kemudian sebab masa dah berjalan. Good evening. And it's a great pleasure to meet my hero YB Rafizi here. Oh, well, let me make a ruling here. <laughs> First is, who chose 
to raise the hand first the lady or was it the gentleman the gentleman the, the gentleman yes ah jadi puan kejap ya please okay i have a very perplexing question in my mind uh, name and then you my know my name is uh, mugunta i'm an architect okay i'm the president of lango indian chamber of commerce this matter of, you see i was looking at uh, sri lanka they have a debt of 50 billion us and they became bankrupt pakistan had a debt of 100 billion us and they became bankrupt I put the mic to your they become bankrupt but what perplexing to me is we have a debt of 1500 billion and we are happy in this country we got everything going even the egg price is going up also but we are happy no money also we are happy i hope in an economic point of view can you i just cannot figure out we have 1500 billion pakistan no electricity no water no gas sri lanka no pak no electricity no gas no nothing what's happening is this a magic we are going through i hope why be my hero can you answer good, this good question good question very clear You see, we have to differentiate just as we run a company between the so-called balance sheet and profit and loss and the cash flow. You see, the, the debt, you know, um, um, we have 1.6 trillion uh, ringgit debt, right? As a percentage of the size of our economy is, is actually quite comparable. Our problem is with that only 11% tax revenue every year basically our cash flow is in trouble and that's exactly if you are not careful and if you don't manage our cash flow well despite whatever is happening in the economy the cash flow problem leads to default like sri lanka and pakistan and anywhere and for that matter argentina from time to time so we have to separate between the so called cash flow and the, like i always say is fiscal position and fiscal position and the actual economic growth and the economic potential of this country so to your question why are we happy and i know ton you know trying to say you know are we happy or not happy um actually economically we are not you know on as a country we have all the potential I will not be doing my duty if I come here and say that we are going down. We can do so much better to unlock, but of course, no matter how much the private sector or the economy grows, if the government doesn't manage our fiscal spending and our fiscal allocation properly, Sri, Sri Lanka we will be sometime in the future. So So that's why um, we have to separate between the two, between facilitating the economy and and sending the right signal and uh, and pumping the right allocation, so that the, the the economy continue to grow to reach its potential. But we also have to have the fiscal discipline, and that's when whatever Tun uh, mentioned is all about politics. Those are the politics bit: uh, corruption, mismanagement, bureaucracy. um the you know the 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 lack of political decisiveness those hopefully is what is our duty so that we will have a much better fiscal position then you know we can see that while the economy grows whatever the government gets it will be plowed back and people can feel you know the fact that it's really in tandem with economic growth thank you yb aton uh, would you like to Uh, just one word <laughs> one word means a few <laughs> that is uh, make it simply make it simple um, with your respects to rafizi all the explanation is there but that relates to people who understand better but the ordinary people don't understand they are like you and me to me it is simply simple simple simpler if i to tell you if i can tell you that one of the strength of the malaysian economy is that we have natural resources 
as well as the fact that we do have responsible leadership when it comes to issues that affect us. I'll stop there. Thank you, Don. Uh, yes, we more. need one more? Yes, the lady. Uh, from, yeah. uh, the lady at the back there. Uh, nama dengan uh, uh, okay. tempat kerja ataupun uh, wakil siapa? Sila. Uh, saya Rozaini binti Muhammad Rosli, uh, PhD candidate dalam science politics di IIUM. Oh, pengkaji science politics, yeah? Yeah. Sila. So, uh, Rafizi, you mentioned about, you know, uh, you implied about implication, uh, the standard of living of Malaysians. And uh, I gather that the two factors uh, contributing to that would be the cost of living and the um, uh, income level uh, of the people. So, um, actually, uh, there are other issues related, for instance, could you climate, be more focused yeah. so that the question is there? Yeah, the, you didn't say about climate change and how it affects the people, economy, uh, the outcome of those uh, disasters and things like that. Question, man. Okay, so, uh, <laughs> and also you mentioned about subsidies, you know, all these are interrelated. But yes, I uh, agree that you need to be more uh, focused and to outline you exactly must, what, me, madam, what you want madam, uh, to... Yeah. Pardon me, listen. Yes. Please put up your question. So what, what do you think or what are you going to do with the subsidies and expenditure of the government to improve cost of living and also the uh, level of income of the people? Thank Great. you very much. Now the answer can come. We, we, the subsidy bill for 2022, I think, will hit about it plus billion, you know, um, and the subsidy bill goes to everyone. And so um, what we will do is that um, this idea that by right, if you have one basic income level, that um, anything below that government has to supplement, at least to be able to, to live a decent life. And, I mean, that's, macam Tone will say, Tan Sri will say, that's in theory. It is in theory, and the reason it remains in theory until today when everyone expects it to be done. And if we do that, we will be able to save 20 plus billion going forward from time to time, from which we can plow back to many other more important sectors. The reason it remains in theory is because for us to be able to do that, we need the whole infrastructure to do that. That means that the data infrastructure, infrastructure has to be in place. The um, delivery infrastructure has to be in place. So we hope by rationalization of subsidy, by targeting, it means that it, gives, it goes directly to those families who are really in need and we can consolidate all the fragmented cash aid here and price subsidy here, fuel subsidy there consolidate it ideally into one universal cash aids and then it goes directly to household. Um, once we do that, we will be able to strengthen our fiscal um, condition. We will have extra billions and those extra billions will go back to education, to health because that health, for example, is going to be a high cost going forward and we are slowly becoming an aging society, um, you know, and it will cause a lot more for me 10, 15 years down the line, for example, than, than maybe Tansri and Tun now, um, and we live longer nowadays, you know, so um, in that sense, I think that's why, as I started my speech by saying the easy part of this administration task is the diagnosis. The diagnosis has been spoken about for decades. Uh, is the get on to it that is difficult. And that is the bit that I say we have actually quite a small window because all these key decisions, the get on part, has to be done in a matter of months. Because once those big decisions are done, 
it does take some time to put all the infrastructure in place to consolidate and you start you roll out the pilot test and start, then you scale up to the whole country um, as much as it sounds extremely complicated if you are looking at it from from government's perspective and that's why it was very difficult to get to, to, to be done in the last one decade once I think we make those decisions and we start the first few steps everything else I think will move so much faster that hopefully within two to three years um, we don't have this discussion anymore and that's I think my task um, that's why I say hopefully within one year um, if I come back here I can tell straight away whether I fail in my first year or not but now all those six months, six months hopefully by then turn some of key decisions have been on the table for a very long time it just needs to be done and but i think within six months i i'm quite positive it will be done yeah so far yeah all right okay uh, terima kasih yang berhormat uh, saudara rafizi uh, saya berjanji tadi supaya kuan-kuan dapat lima soalan ya yeah? uh, one more actually there are two gentlemen uh, which one you you saw first? I think the gentleman. The one in black. In the batik, yeah. The one in batik first. Okay. Yes. Sorry. A lot earlier. Uh, to a brief see. and to the point. Okay. Uh, I'll jump, jump, jump straight into it. So I want to use um, YB's. Uh, sorry, my name is Chuck. I run a website called My MP, which monitors MPs. Um, I wanted to ask um, about YB's metaphor of Malaysia is obese, and uh, a lot of people um, in the states who are obese use wheelchairs. And I wanted to ask all three of you whether you guys would consider low-skilled foreign labor a wheelchair, and whether or not we want to get low-skilled foreign labor. Low-skilled. Yeah, low-skilled foreign labor. Do you consider that a wheelchair, and do you think that we need to do something about it in the years to come? And what is that? Thank you. Yes, yes, um, and and that's why you notice uh, lately I do, pick, you know, um, um, respond to, for example. Um, price elasticity and about consumer behavior and so on because sometimes in some cases we do get addicted to something and we do get addicted to foreign cheap foreign labors it's just that because we have been addicted to cheap foreign labors that's why we are stuck with so-called um, low cost um, uh, manufacturing economy so it's a painful thing uh, that we have to do. I'm going to sit down, for example, with restaurateurs next in the next few weeks because we have to move away from employing foreign laborers in our FNB. Um, we have to um, allow for we we have to get used, for example, of not having waitresses working full time. They come in the morning when there's peak, there's a lull, you have less. So instead of saying, you know, I need someone who can stay there from 7 o'clock in the morning to 12 midnight, because that's what foreign labourers do, most probably you have to manage different shifts at different time. It's, it sounds more complicated now, but unless we remove that wheelchair, uh, you know, we will continue to be obese. So yes, on the spot. Finally, one more. Yes, lady, yes, whom did you see first? Uh, the, the gentleman at the back. Silakan. Uh, tolong ringkas. Thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. My name is Iskandar. I'm a legal practitioner. <coughs> uh, regarding resetting the economy, what the I have to go straight to the point. What the PM10 has done by executing the Malaysia Agreement 1963 is actually resetting the economy from pm1 until pm9 no one has actually was very serious were very serious in implementing in honoring the agreement i'm talking about my area law legal why does a legal practitioner need a special permission to go to sarawak court to appear in Sabah court to handle only a single case every time we need to be given a permission we need 
immigration permit. What is this? But, Thank you, Encik Iskandar. Yes. Uh, as compared to the Sabahan, the Sarawakian, the legal practitioner, they are free. All they right. can come and set. So can we improve on this? In addition to honoring what are the rights of Sabahan, Sarawakian, but can we balance it up? If we have to amend a bit the agreement, can we do that? This are resetting. Right, the, right. The, the I'm English. sure um, the panelists Thank got you. the question. Thank you. So sorry for, 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 yes. for being too, a bit personal about this is my area. I need to, to do this every time I have case there. Thank you. I, I think that there's only, always two sides of the same coin. You know, that, that is the perspective from us in Semenanjung. But obviously, if, if we are in Sabah and Sarawak, the perspective is different. The perspective is that everything has been so lopsided that, you know, we um, in Sabah and Sarawak feel that they have not caught up with development. Okay? So, as much as it is a political question, because of course you can always go and negotiate and negotiate and negotiate. But at least from the economic perspective, I think um, you know, the, the um, spillover from what we are trying to do to um, make it more equitable, um, eventually hopefully builds and close the gap so much so that I think the Sabah and Sarawak and the Semenanjung see as a whole economic unit without having to say this is my territory and my economic cake and that's yours. And it's, it is a process. Um, um, I still, same like everyone else, you know, I, I still have to, in fact I was still banned um, and only, you know, when I was in, in Sarawak last Friday, uh, it's only at the airport they realised that um, despite being a minister now, I'm still banned in Sarawak. But they very quickly removed the ban. Lah. Um, but I, I think, uh, Iskandar, I think hopefully uh, it is a process that we close as much economically because it's, it's economic in nature to a certain extent. Uh, the origin of it was economy in nature. So once it feels more equitable to the Sabah and Sarawak, I think it's a lot easier to talk about renegotiating or re, you know, allowing a more free flow of professionals between Sabah, Sarawak and Semenanjo. Pardon me, YB. We are, not, we are not setting up the office there. Just a si sing single case from time to time. I think that sorry, is sorry, answered, sorry, and to be fair, we distributed. Yes. We have had five. Yes. Yes. I leave we back. Six. Six already. Yes. Okay. I, I, I leave think it that's back a to fair you. number. Right. Um, uh, that marks the end of the question and answer session. For those who still have that burning question that needs to be asked, um, you know, the kind that can, wouldn't let you fall asleep tonight, um, you can email us your questions. And just like the practice in the Dewan Rakyat and Dewan Negara, you'll get a written answer, probably. <laughs> My takeaway word for today is, get on with it. So, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, the next item, I promise you this is the, almost the last item, um, is a presentation of Momento. I would like to invite Yang Berbahagia Datuk Nur Yahati Awang, a Chief Administrator of Parliament to accompany Yang Berhormat Senator Tan Sri Datuk Sri Utama Dr. Rais Yatim to the front for this small ceremony. I would like to invite Yang Amat Berbahagia Tun Musa Hitam to receive the humble memento from Parliament of Malaysia. And also to Yang Berhormat Tuan Muhammad um, Rafizi Ramli.
Okay, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we are now at the end of this event. I would like to thank everyone for your participation in making this event a success. Hopefully, we'll meet again in the coming Parliament Lecture Series. A reminder from the Secretariat, please scan the QR code on the security pass obtained from the security upon entrance. Failure to do so, you'll have problem leaving the Parliament compound. I shall leave you with a loose translation of an old Malay pantun. If there is a broken needle, don't keep it inside a wooden crate. If there is any blunder on my part, don't keep it in your heart. Thank you. With that, I wish you good night. And assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And thank you.